Beamers brought this car to Avita and died. These cadets will be the finest troopers we've trained. I have faith in them. Hey! <laughs> you can live with me. <laughs> What's up meta nerds? This video will break down the very strange Arcana species. Looking at everything from their homeworld, biology, culture, impact on the galaxy, and psychedelic addictions that everyone just thought was a joke and made fun of them for. And we'll be pulling everything in from legends and canon. The story begins at grid coordinates 011, within the slice of the inner rim. The Tycho Rho system centered around a single sun, a blue giant star. It's unclear how many other planets or moons are in this system, but Kona itself has a single moon, 28 hour day, and 298 days in a year. Which is where the Earth and Coruscant comparison stop, because its atmosphere was type 4, meaning every alien species would require a complete environment suit, not just a rebreather mask like you might get away with on a class 2 or 3, but the air itself was poisonous to most species, being highly concentrated ammonia, which could cause chemical burns in the eyes, nose, and if inhaled, burnt everything from the mouth down into the lungs. A truly horrifying way to die. But for the natives, the Arcona's entire biology relies on ammonia for everything from nutrient transport, breathing, temperature regulation, and moving waste. So in living off-world, even though they could breathe other airs, they would have to find ways to supplement themselves with ammonia. They evolved competing against predators like the Dagger Lips, and modern Arcona would stand about 1.8 to 2 meters tall. Taller than most humanoids, but shorter than a Wookiee and would mature at about the same rate as humans. They are cold-blooded, and described as scaleless reptiles, specifically a serpentine reptilian humanoid, whose skin felt like tree bark. Their sense organs were similarly distributed like most humanoids, with a unique crescent-shaped brain and cranium. These large, glittering eyes are in some ways like the Rodians, and you know I'm always looking out for those celestial and ricotta influences in species, as they actually created many of the different species, and is why so many of them are humanoids, though we can't confirm that here. And while these eyes are enormous, they have very poor eyesight, and these glitter dots you are seeing are actually large clusters of thousands of tiny photoreceptors, each of which would see in a particular wavelength. But they really might have the worst vision of any species out there, definitely any of those we've covered so far, as the photoreceptors couldn't even generate definite shapes with any reasonable acuity. Everything is like a psychedelic blur and flowing of colors. It is only because of this diamond-shaped organ located in between their eyes, which is often confused for their nose, but it's actually a heat-seeking organ that has more acuity than those big eyes. So the only way they could make out objects even as large as people were because they had a specific heat signature. In this sense, the eyes are secondary to the heat vision, while their olfactory organs are located in the tongue, so that, like most reptiles, they would flick their tongue to pick up the smells in their environment. This olfactory sense was by far their strongest, to the point that even if they couldn't read your name tag, or tell the difference between a bunch of humanoids leaving the sauna, they could pick up on the slightest pheromones and sweat differences across each individual, eventually figuring out what smell they produced for a variety of emotions like fear, being calm, or happy. Their homeworld would revolve around the blue giant Teko Ro with no axial tilt, resulting in no season, just being hot and humid all year long, about the same temperature wherever you were on Kona. It is called a desert jungle, which sounds like an odd combo of terms, but means that it was lush with plant life, but no rain. This was achieved through unique plant life that was able to produce its own water by interacting with the three major elements in the air. Some were so complex that they would secrete an acid that bore down into the bedrock to release large amounts of oxygen being stored in the ground. That species would store water in these large gastric pods along its roots. All the leaves too would break down ammonia into its elements hydrogen and nitrogen, then using the hydrogen to combine with that released oxygen to produce fresh tasty H2O. And so the waste of this process was nitrogen. This makes the jungles perpetually covered in thick but invisible clouds of nitrogen, which goes back to how deadly this world is because though humans and most species could safely breathe air with a mix of these elements, in this amount, the nitrogen would push the oxygen out of your lungs, and you would quickly pass out and suffocate. The Arcana would use their thick and sharp claws to dig into the ground and rip up these roots to drink from these water pods. Like humans developing civilization near coasts and rivers, the Arcona society tried to build close to these plants resulting in a large operation that worked like a mine, digging deep into the ground, but also like a farm in that they would find ways to cultivate these and develop methods for greater yields, while also serving the function of a well. As these societies grew, they would stay strongly communal up through contact with the galaxy at large, so much so that they rarely made use of the word I, 
Instead, they usually framed everything in terms of we, with males being responsible for raising the children, as the females were on average much more reckless and irresponsible, despite the fact that males are very cautious in mate selection, taking years to settle down with an individual woman, and would see marriage as serving the purpose of producing children. And there was great shame if it could have been reasonably predicted that your offspring would not contribute to society. Although we do not have a lot of detail on wildlife or weather conditions here on Kona, it is stated that because it was such a dangerous world, even to the natives, they would live in communities called nests, being focused on new parents, all safely gathered in these well-defended nests that were underground, and kept within 20 kilometers or 12 miles of the Grand Nest. Every 20 days, representatives from each nest would meet in the Grand Nest to discuss local issues and progress on their shared goals with the elected nest leader conducting the meeting and helping break ties, as well as positing their own initiatives like a city mayor. As a species, they never turned these social projects to the hard sciences, so they never developed complex technology, or a deep understanding of the physical world around them, nor do they have any notable spiritual views or religion. Almost all arcana are either workers, be it building things, mining, or processing food, and the others are all teachers for the children. But again, the education was only on practical day-to-day -day concerns. It is unclear when the first off-worlders arrived, but as soon as they realized the lengths these reptilians went to get water, they quickly started trading water shipments for thousands of miles of undeveloped land. The aliens came with fancy scanners, and their culture's investments in the hard sciences reported the discovery of enormous reserves of all kinds of precious metals. The Arcana thought it was odd to be so excited about something that was neither food or water, and watched on as the aliens erected impressive spaceports. That quickly brought the odd metal species called droids, and countless blurry colored smelly species from all over the galaxy. The spaceports expanded to become sprawling cities, likely all connected and contained to keep out the toxic atmosphere. The off-world CEOs were ecstatic to find that their managers on Kona relayed a detail that would save the company millions of credits. The locals were addicted to salt. Everyday table salt, sodium chloride, would act as a hallucinogen in the Arcana body messing with their brains and specifically the receptors in their eyes to create wild visuals, which is saying something for a species that sees the world like a cheap kaleidoscope to begin with. Workers realized that salt was worth its weight in gold, and were trading salt for all kind of goods. The company realized it would be easier and cheaper to start doing all their deals in salt instead of water. This would become a compounding issue for the natives, as of course, the salt made you thirstier, and it was already hard to get water, but also that it would lead to the failure of an organ that helped to convert ammonia to water within the body, so doubling the effects of the salt thirst. Their eyes would also change color from green to gold, and a salt addict would crave 25 grams a day before the painful withdrawals would kick in. Because of the fact that more females were reckless, they made up a majority of the addicts, with many a happy family being destroyed by the off-worlder's deadly foreign drug. These intensely communal people look back at this time as a plague that nearly destroyed their civilization. Almost all Arcona would treat salt heads like animals, and there was no punishment for killing anyone found to be dealing salt on world. It seems the vigilantism was even encouraged. Once the practices of these mining companies were revealed, the older public crackdown was intense, and did help develop more layers of government aimed at understanding the biology and culture of all species it came in contact with. As with alien exchange, you could never predict every odd phenomena, but you could promote a culture to detect and report these issues immediately, and help shut it down before it became a global plague. And it is a great look at just how specific and regional laws could be, with all salt trade banned within this system, punished like spice or other illicit drugs. And this had to be a logistics nightmare for the companies trying to follow the law, keeping track of all these local regulations as you conducted trade on a galactic scale. Like you might guess though, the black market for salt was still able to keep the supply going to anyone thirsty enough for it, being way harder to really crack down on than spice, as it would be perfectly legal just one solar system over. And it's a pretty believable excuse to just say you didn't even know about these laws. It's unclear whatever happened to the company Nemlor Minerals, which was the largest mining operation on Kona, growing so powerful and influential across many worlds that they were granted their own seat in the Senate like what we saw with the later Trade Federation. And you might think that they'd be jaded against the alien community, or fearful of the sins and poisons of the space travelers, but their people were very adventurous and curious. For many nests, the Allure would bring their entire community to negotiate contracts to settle other worlds, being able to work for different companies in areas that were deadly to most species, while keeping their strong family ties even as they spread out across the stars. This way, they were able to quickly amass wealth, here measured in credits, not water, and though one of the stranger and more primitive people of the galactic community, they eventually came to be seen in all major cities and spaceports, and you would see Arcana tourists everywhere. 
So though their world was obscure and often passed by, and so unlike many other humanoids in everything from biology to culture, they were one of the most recognizable to their new alien brethren. There were also many Jedi, as Force sensitivity is about average in expression among Arcana, and there are no record of any Sith. Even with their weakness to salt, potentially stifling an oppressive culture that wanted you to suppress your individuality, apparently none of them fell to the dark side's promise of endless salt in being able to proudly say I. Eventually, their native tongue of Arcanese was just about lost after generations off-world, where they easily picked up basic and spoke it without any major issues. Even back home, most would speak basic as well just to keep up with their family abroad. They were also noted for being able to pick up a variety of other alien languages, two being the Hanemth and the Dwinaguin, two very different species that immigrated to parts of Kona, likely coming with the mining work and growing their worker settlements into proper cities. And so if you want to see three of the galaxy's weirdest species, but only have time for one trip, just head to Kona. But they definitely did not have an impact on culinary history, as everything from their home world had ammonia in it, and they always wanted at least a touch of ammonia on even the finest alien cuisine. Everyone thought this was odd, and some chefs thought this was insulting to their craft, and more than one would get back at them by exploiting their salt weakness. Most species heard about this strange addiction, and many thought it was just funny to watch an arcana go salty, with so many off-world ones being addicted that most people never saw the natural green color eyes, and assumed that the addict yellow-gold eyes were their normal ones. One gag was to leave a big salt shaker at the table, and just watch them go crazy dumping the whole thing on their meal. It got so bad that by 22 BBY, the government back on Kona called on the Jedi Order to help them, and Stas Ali would be successful in breaking up a salt smuggling operation, which always found a ways of popping up throughout their history. When the Clone Wars started, it would be the 4th Sector Army, led by Coyote Mundi, that helped to keep this area relatively untouched by CIS forces. It's unknown if the threat to his people helped to motivate bounty hunter LS to train clones on Kamino, but his kind and gentle demeanor was typical for the Arcona. Remember, this is only a practice test. And besides, the Citadel course was constructed to be a difficult challenge. Once the Empire was announced, most Arcona were big supporters of the new government, seeing a unified galaxy with strong centralized leadership as one big happy communal family, with the Emperor as the Grand Nest leader, and the Nest representatives being the Moths appointed to each region. But this love would start to die out over the years, and though there are no major Imperial events against this species, you have to imagine that this very strange, alien-looking race wouldn't have fared well under the human supremacist culture in the Empire. During the Civil War, there was an ever-growing camp for salt addicts on Kashyyyk, and this might have been some sort of peaceful retreat from the big cities, a detox camp away from the endless chains of tempting restaurants. While on Tatooine, Hamdazen was stranded. A pit stop on his trip would change his life forever, when he stumbled upon a delicious local drink at Chalman's Spaceport Cantina. Jury juice with a salted rim turned into extra salt dumped into the cocktail, then raw lines of the stuff off the table. With no credits left to his name after his bender, he was stuck here and forced to take any odd jobs on this dusty backwater just to get his fix. Back home, Kona was quick to join the New Republic, backing it for the same reasons they did the Empire, but now they were actually respected and they helped the best they could in the fight against the Yuuzhan Vong, but they didn't have much to offer in terms of local military or technological expertise. Kona was quick to fall, though at least they weren't terraformed into something inhospitable to the native species. Eventually, they were liberated by the Galactic Alliance, and in the later generations of Jedi, you see two more added to their ranks with Vala Razel and Izal Waz. So that's it for their history and breakdown. For behind-the-scenes facts, there was an Arcana that was part of Sidon Ethano's pirate crew, but he was swept up in a sandstorm while hunting down the lost treasure of Count Dooku. And there was the lovable old lady Garma on the Colossus space station. Sadly, I do wonder if her fate is like the sad salty boy of Tatooine, as we do see she has those bright salt-fried eyes. Those early mining colonies paying them in salt might be a reference to the word salary coming from the word salt, where the ancient Romans were paid their wages in salt. Hamdazen was a simple, pivoting puppet, with lights in his eyes, and he was called T-Head on set. If you look close, you can see the flashlight that was shoved into the back of his head, and that jury juice that he drank is made from Rhodian blood. While the species was expanded upon in the Ultimate Alien Anthology, Essential Guide to Species, The Atlas, and Galaxy at War Guide. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out our sponsor, Upside. Upside is a cashback app that enables people to get more value for their purchases and improve the profitability of local businesses, helping communities grow stronger. Already, they've partnered with 30,000 businesses and 25,000 gas stations across 48 states and DC. 
It is real cash back. Finally, someone has made it straightforward and simplified. Not the annoying points, miles, or loyalty reward conversions like some credit cards. You just cash out whenever you want and get it rewarded back to your bank account. The way it works is you check in on the app, use the card at a gas station, restaurant, or grocery store, and you'll see your cash back starting to stack up. What's funny is it works with any card payment you want. So while Upside users are earning three times cash back compared to those credit card cash back programs, you can still use that card you've been using and simply by checking in and using Upside, you can get two cashback systems going. I just pull it up, search the area, and see a full list of locations with all kinds of great options. For me, the most regular and rewarding stops have been the gas stations, which I'm sure will help a bunch of you out there. To get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. Use my promo code METANERDS and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Thanks Upside for sponsoring this video. The best way to help me out is to hit that like button, comment down below, share the video, and subscribe if you want to see more. Special thanks to our patrons, but most important of all, remember, one man's salt is another man's spice, and the force will be with you, always.